You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. I'm Jared Mounts. And it's been a while since been we've, a while. we've been, we've we've been together. Decided, yeah. <laughs> I've been watching that. I've been watching your episodes and enjoy them. Actually, get on the elliptical. I'm working out a little bit. I'll pull it up and watch watch different segments. And it's good stuff. A lot of good information. We're getting a lot of good guests. How was your first fishing tournament of the year? Did you want to do a quick little recap of that with the kids? Oh, it was. We actually had our last qualifier uh, on the Chickahominy. Uh, it was a grind. Um, Seventy four combined boats uh, for the senior division had fifty one, and the the middle school, elementary school age kids. Um, you know, the remaining twenty some or whatever, but. Out of 74 boats that were on the water, 41 didn't even weigh a fish uh, this past weekend. So it was literally a grind. Now, there are some teams that found some big fish. I think with the junior division weighed a 20 pound bag, 19, a little bit shy of 20, uh, a little bit shy of nine pound, largemouth was caught. Um, so it was, we had, we've had four teams out of eight qualify for states. And my two kids, they did, they caught two fish, finished 12th, and they were able to qualify for states. We're pretty excited about that. That's awesome. But uh, it's always good to get out, get out and, uh, especially watching these young kids too, uh, seeing how well they do. And, you know, it continues to grow. And uh, anytime you can get anybody on the water, it's, you know, fishing, it's a good thing. It, it really is. And really good into our next guest here. We had the pleasure earlier this year, guys, to have Mark Frondorf on from the Shenandoah Riverkeeper Association, which was awesome. And until talking to him and you about it, I didn't realize like the Riverkeepers were such a big organization mm -hmm. and how, and how many other places they're located besides the Shenandoah. And then, after I got done meeting with the Department of Wildlife Resources down in Richmond, you know, they told me about the James River Keepers Association and then, you know, lay weeds on the way. And I got in contact with this gentleman, Rob Campbell, who is the Upper James Regional Manager. And he really blessed us with the ability to drive all the way up from Richmond to do an in-person interview. And we can pick his brain about, you know, what I called Virginia's River because it cuts through like the heart of Virginia. And I didn't really realize we talked about this beforehand. I, I think I mentioned this a couple on a couple other shows. You think of the James and you think of maybe Richmond down. And I think of the old Richmond mm -hmm. that is like it's polluted. It, no one lives there and it's completely changed. And the river's changed as well. And then there's another part of the river which goes from Richmond all the way through Lynchburg, all the way to, to like mm -hmm. Moomaw. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's up near us. And right. that's just insane to think of like that's where the James River starts. Mm -hmm. Rob, thank you so much for coming in today. I really oh, absolutely. It. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. And then one thing quick, just turn the mic, put it right there to your face, just like Got that. It. Got yeah, it. You're yep. fine. Got it. Perfect. People won't know when I edit it, so. <laughs> sure, that's right. Yeah. No, but yeah, thank you so much for coming out today and, and really kind of tell everybody at home, like, how did you get into this and, and how did this whole thing start for you? Sure, sure. And to throw it out there real quick, the James is actually dubbed by Congress to be America's founding river. So, right, not only is it Virginia's river, America's founding river right here in Virginia. So, <laughs> Well, yeah, from Jamestown to Westward Expansion and, and moving west and all that stuff from the from the late the early 1600s stuff. We, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I, so my life on the James started early. I grew up uh, in Amherst County, actually north of uh, Lynchburg, um, and that's right on the banks of the James. Actually, it has 55 miles of James River frontage, which is second to only one county, uh, and it's Buckingham County, uh, just south of us here, that has 55.1 miles, actually. So the, Amherst has barely the second uh, amount of river mileage uh, on the James River. Uh, and grew up early. My dad and I would float the river, fish the river, uh, out in the old John boat back in the uh, in the early 90s uh, doing it when uh, not many kayaks and canoes were doing it like That's they are right. now uh, and uh, we would you know spend half the time fishing half the time bailing water out of the bottom of the boat to keep <laughs> keep moving down ri river uh, because the James is a shallow rocky river but uh, many good memories uh, working my way up through uh, a, a, a kind of uh, teenage years and, and high school years found myself on the river a lot uh, going on those different little stretches that I'd never done before filling in the blank spots on the map for myself to kind of see where uh, where I was and and after uh, college uh, was present or during during college, worked for a, uh, a livery, actually out of Lynchburg, so putting people on the water, doing canoeing, kayaking, tubing, 
um, and got into doing some jet boating as well. So finding those different stretches of the James. Meanwhile, you know, fishing and all that along the way. Uh, and after I graduated from uh, Randolph College in Lynchburg with a degree in environmental studies, um, a, a job with the James River Association opened up in Lynchburg, um, and that worked out to be just perfect. Uh, so I've been with them ever since and been with them for about 10 years. So, that is yeah. so freaking cool. Yeah. So then like, how did you, we were talking about uh, beforehand, how did you want to break this down? Did you want to start up at the at the confluence or at, at the headwaters and then just work our way down? We can talk a little bit about the James. Sure, sure. And I think the the perfect place to start is, is the upper James. Of course, we'll flow like the river does and go down and talk about everything as we move downstream. But interestingly enough, there's a spot at the very headwaters of the Jackson River, which if we if you were to go to the top of that map that's pictured there, you might be able to see it. Right here. But uh, it would actually be past Clifton Forge, all the way up above Lake Moomaw. It might be actually difficult and not on this map here. But just an interesting story because we're in the Shenandoah watershed. There's a barn in a field way up in the Jackson River watershed um, that you, if you're standing on it, when during a, standing next to it during a rainstorm, Half of the roof uh, will shed water into the Jackson River watershed, which will end up going into the James. The other half of the roof sends water into the Shenandoah River watershed and will send it into the Potomac River That's Basin awesome. to make its way down to the Chesapeake. So we're way more connected than you know. Mm -hmm. our, our watersheds are backed up to each mm -hmm. other uh, as far as uh, from the Shenandoah to the James. So when you cross that certain ridge, uh, you've, you're out of, the, out of the Shenandoah and into the James. Um, and our two uh, headwater rivers are the Cow Pasture and the Jackson, um, two just incredibly beautiful rivers uh, that are up in the mountains, western part of Virginia. Uh, near the towns of Covington and Clifton Forge. Um, the Jackson River is the farthest west, so we'll start there. And actually, had the Jackson had a lot of big plans for it back in the day. There was a canal actually proposed to go up the uh, length of the James River, all the way up the Jackson River, cross the mountains into the Greenbrier River in West Virginia, down into the new and the Kanawha, and then of course would take you over you into no way. the Ohio. I love cool. the history of this stuff. Yeah, too. Like, it's so old, awesome. old school. Wow. So that was that would have been a major, major connection. They actually the canal actually made it to Buchanan, Virginia, which is wow. in the western part, and then this Upper James a section that we'll be talking about. So a lot of history up here. People have been moving up and down the James for a long time, um, and uh, the the Jackson is just a really unique, unique waterway. Of course, it starts in the National Forest primarily. There's a lot of, of private land up there still too but it runs through just some pristine habitats um, before making its way into lake moomaw which is a a little known gem in the western part of the state a uh, cold water fishery that's got lots of different species mm -hmm. of fish in it from chain pickerel to um to musky to of course our walleye and then our, our normal more normal large mouth small mouth uh bluegill um and uh crappy all those things are in there too catfish of course as well so just an incredible fishery uh, in the western part of the state and uh provides a really an interesting interesting setup for the lower part of the Jackson River as it makes its way down to the town of Covington for about 20 or so miles below the uh, Lake Moomaw, which is that cold water that's coming out of the bottom of that lake. That water just gets cold as it sits at the bottom and which provides a really um, a really immaculate fishery for trout uh, below the dam and all the way uh, down to the town of Covington. So really just a beautiful stretch. Uh, there's some outfitters up there that can get you up on the river. Uh, Twin River Outfitters, or excuse me, Allegheny Outdoors um, is the is the one that's all the way up there, and they can get you in a kayak out there. There is some issues with some private land ownership up there. King's Grant issues on the Jackson River stuff uh, is always very well marked, though, as you're making your way. If you're a new person going up there, as you're entering at access points, there are very well displayed maps that show you um, uh, that you should be fishing or not be fishing here um, because of that. And luckily, that's one of the only rivers in the James River watershed where we have have those problems. So. Could, could you let the listeners know at home and explain that a little bit more about the King's Grant? Because I, I do find these old, outdated, antiquated laws so fascinating. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is fascinating. And it's whereas it's kind of a thorn in a lot of our <laughs> outdoorsmen side right now, it is very interesting in the fact that uh, we still kind of have some of these around. And I'm by no means a King's Grant expert, so I'm, I'm going to give that caveat right off the bat. But uh, King's Grant um, uh, land... Um, um, claims are claims from families that have had unbroken chains of ownership of pieces of land that have been passed down through generations that were originally given to these families by the King of England. Granted, and they have to be able to prove that it's an unbroken chain of ownership. Um, and by br to break the chain, you need to sell it to a different entity. And as soon as you, that property is sold, modern Virginia law will then take over. 
Um, and you all may be wondering, why does that matter? Um, and what it comes to is the actual borders of your property um, when it pertains to the waterways. Hmm. Um, current Virginia law kind of stops it at the edge of the waterway at the mean high watermark on a navigable river. And the King's Grant would actually carry that property line to the center of the river. Hmm. And we would you would own the bottom of the river also, hmm. um, especially if you own on the other side of the river, you'd own the entire river bottom. Um, and so there, there are some issues that, that folks have been uh, nabbed for trespassing just by wading through some of these sections that uh, these folks own land bottom ownership or river bottom ownership, as well as even uh, your lure touching the bottom, even if you're, you're kind of standing outside of it or floating over it in a boat. Um, there but has you been could, some. You can float it. Can you float through it? You can float through it. Just don't touch the bottom. Just, just kind of keep on moving through that little section right. that's that should be pretty well marked, and uh, you'll see the no trespassing signs. Um, and then once you're out of that section, you're back free and clear again to fish. And it's a beautiful river to float. Um, it's got several good access points up there to, to go down for sure. Very yeah. Interesting. Yeah, very interesting. And that, you know, there, even through the town of Covington, as you float down into the, as for access points to kind of reach the James, you know, there's still some trout swimming around, you know, the mm -hmm. town of Covington. So you've, you've just got that interesting cold water fishery. Uh, you do have some paper mills up there. That's one of our largest paper mills on the river is actually on the Jackson. Um, uh, and they, they have, of, of course, their input to the river. But for many years, they've been kind of held to task by federal agencies to make sure that they're dumping their uh, only a, a modicum of what they used to and only what they're allowed to uh, to the river when it's at a certain level and to make sure that all of their operations are running smoothly. But, you know, as as we have industries along the river, we have a lot to worry about. You know, is that just, change in water temperature coming out? on a discharge or anything? Like uh, that is one concern for sure. Yeah, thermal pollution is a big one, uh, making sure that that water is cooled as best as possible mm -hmm. to come back uh, into the river. And there's kind of a range of what it can be in that they're allowed to get it back to. And generally they do a pretty good job. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, I, I have seen no actual evidence that they've come, that they've broken that threshold. Mm -hmm. So um, now not to say that it doesn't ever happen, but mm -hmm. you know, no evidence. If we don't have facts, we don't have facts about it. But, and that's a good thing too, like Kelby was talking about, like the, the idea that there those is. balls are in existence and that there are people monitoring that, watching that, you know, trying to make sure they protect their resource. Um, yeah. yeah. The, you know, there is some good rules and regulations out there. Yeah, there is. And they're, they're very important. And it's not to say that it's something that's written in stone. Right. It's a living document that kind of changes as we understand things a little bit more. And um, our state agent and federal agencies really have left a, a pretty good guideline for companies to go through. Now, you know, there's, there's, we've had incidents up there before. Um, this is, you know, really no fault of the company, but I um, mean, there was a massive rainstorm up there one day uh, and they had some of the ponds getting close to filling up mm -hmm. um, and, and leaching out, which probably would have been a little bit more material than they were allowed to let out that day. Mm -hmm. But again, that's, that's an act of God type situation. Right. There was a Can't monsoon going on up there. Yeah, it was, that was out of their control. So, and, and for, for, for our iHeart Spotify listeners that aren't watching on YouTube right now, we have Google Earth up because I think it's fascinating when you look at the way this was built. And then and you probably don't know this, but I'm saying that this was probably built like what, 60s, 70s? Like it was a while yep. ago. Maybe and you 50s, can, yeah. You can tell it was built a while ago just by how close it is to the riverbank. It's absolutely insane. Yeah. And it almost reminds you almost like, like an old movie from Pittsburgh or something like that. Sure. And you can tell it's like this, something bad will eventually happen here. Like you said, like an act of God when you build it like this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what how do you guys interact with, with, with paper mills or businesses like this um, that are in such close contact with the river systems? Is that something where you have to go in for a checkup to make sure that it's up to code? Like, how does that whole process work? We, with the size of our organization, we hit it from kind of the higher, the higher level end, which is the state regulatory end. We're, we're big, big uh, proponents of all of the, of the regulations that are getting stepped up and, and all the research that's being done as to what that's, what that's, what is happening. Um, we of course do have a vast array of, of a volunteer network that's always out on the water. And if they ever see anything that's out of the ordinary, we get a quick call. And uh, we've actually had a few reports over the years of, of issues that never really came to fruition as big problems but still they were seen you know within you know hours of these things happening and we're basically a reporting agency uh with that and we'll make sure things are followed up on uh to kind of you know that we've we've asked them to fix a problem and if it hasn't been fixed well we'll continue to push or do what's necessary to make sure they're kind of doing their thing but at the end of the day we are not a, an enforcement agency at all mm -hmm. uh, we are we are just out to, to help support the policies really from the general assembly end and from from the federal level of congress to try and make sure that the the best restrictions are in in this as possible but understanding that you know we still 
business still needs to be done, you know, and but we need to make sure that the river is protected first and we can we can make yeah. paper after. It's good to know there's a checks yeah. and balances yeah. and, and there's a watchdog, if, if you will. And, and I, we heard the same thing on the Shenandoah when the, at the dam there was a spill of sorts and uh, and they were quick, like you said, quickly on it. And within within the day, there was already phone calls made, you know, to yeah. the, the organization. So or the Millville yeah. Dam, too. Yeah, the Millville you know, Dam yeah. situation, yeah. When he had that there. And that's where it's so important to have the... That's your spot. <laughs> but that's why it's so important to like have river keepers though. Oh, available. absolutely. Uh, was it Kel? I think it was Kelby that said like they're the canary in the coal mine. They're there right. to make sure they're, they're the boots on the ground. They're the ones that are there to right. be able to like, if there's an issue, hopefully they're the ones that can act first and bring awareness to the right. problem. And, and like we said, how many people don't know? I mean, we fish it all the time, but you never knew you had a river keeper. You know, there was mm -hmm. an organization that would oversee that. And again, just to help protect the, the resource. I mean, that's awesome. It, it's it's all over too. It's not just one system. It's it's all over. And, and like you mentioned, yeah. watershed. I mean, same thing. It it affects the whole watershed. It does. Yes. And like always, guys, uh, link in the episode description will be the number to call just for the Upper James. Um, if you are ever out there and you see something that you think you you should bring to their attention. But uh, anyway, Rob, you can continue. <laughs> oh no, that's that's fantastic. We appreciate all that, and that's that's just great insight because it's it, we are all connected, and we're talking about these little feeder rivers and creeks and smaller streams. But really, our water quality starts up here and if we we lose our quality of water here in the jackson uh what hope do we have to say that as it makes its way 350 miles all the way to the chesapeake so right. and then you said the other one is the cow pasture is that a code name or is that actually the name of the river that is the name of the river really? cow pasture and believe it or not it is the most pristine one of the most pristine rivers in the state and it is absolutely cl clear as a bell you the the water clarity in that river is uh is probably in some cases 12 to 14 feet you can wow. see rocks on the bottom wow. um and it's really only limited by the blueness in the water uh, that's what's that's your limit factor it's not uh, any any particles in the water um, and as, as we see them come together uh, one issue is the Jackson itself is um, as you if you actually if you scroll down on that image just below those dams you see there yep just right there right you there? will see yep oh, the, wow. a difference in the color of, oh, the, of wow. the river oh, wow. so those are the tannins that are coming out of the the ponds um, that are a regulated discharge and they are allowed to discharge a certain amount of those every day and the, the tannins are what are in the leaves and the wood compound as it's breaking down uh, as they're turning into pulp into wood and into um, paper that's just kind of tannic uh, tannic acids and stuff that's in all living things or all living plants anyway um, have varying levels of it um, so those those cloudiness that you see there is, is are the tannins that are on in the water and so when you see the Jackson and the cow pasture come together you see one that looks almost like tea and then you see uh if you go about eight miles downstream on the on google earth you'll see the two come together and that brings up an interesting point so how and, and maybe this is um this is too much for today's conversation but how do they come up with the proper amount of tannic that they're allowed to dump or that because you i'm assuming you want it to dissolve correct sure sure uh, that's that's something that's been done at a much much higher level um you know of course this is we're not the only river systems the shenandoah and the james that have paper mills they're they're everywhere they're across the country on waterways so this is a standard Standard that's been that's been come up with um, throughout the years to make sure that they're they're staying at a healthy level and really that that it's when uh, tannins start to go up enough to start to alter the pH of the river uh, is when things can really start to to go wonky um, and, and as well if they're at that high a level there's going to be some cloudiness in the water and you're going to have if that goes on long enough uh, you you'll have issues with plants not being able to grow and stuff and stuff like that so. Oh, there it yeah, is. there's okay, your there's confluence the there, okay. the head of the James right there. Huh. Yep. And that's probably that picture on Google Earth doesn't doesn't do it justice. But when you uh, flow from one into the other, um, you, you can totally tell that that's going on. Now, I will say that the fishery below all of that is still intact. You, the biggest red eye I've ever caught a rock bass mm -hmm. was 13 inches. Then mm. that's, you know, not much. But for a rock bass, mm -hmm. a little red eye, that's huge. Mm -hmm. I think put on the biggest fight as, as any five pound uh, smallmouth I've ever caught. And that was just below the paper mill there. So the fishery, uh, it doesn't seem as impacted down there. And as we see, as we go down the upper James, you know, the, the, the smallmouth fishery, the muscle fishery uh, doesn't seem to show any long-term negative impact um, to, due to the paper paper mills so what do you consider because when we say upper James I'm assuming like for us like the <laughs> upper Potomac is from the Great Falls up the non-tidal portion sure, sure the James the upper James is so freaking long 
Do you section it off even more than just upper and tidal? We, for general terms, uh, you know, when people think of upper, they'll think above the fall line at Richmond. But really, in, in, our, in our organization, we kind of classify it into three sections. Uh, the, the upper James would be where we're talking about now, the headwaters, um, all the way to the Blue Ridge Mountains, which encompasses... Okay. Or, and really the city of Lynchburg that says it punches through the Blue Ridge Mountains. So that encompasses about 90 so miles of river. Um, and then from Lynchburg to Richmond um, is about 160 miles. And that's what a lot of us think of as the Middle James um, in the area where the, the bateaux still run and the big flat sections and the big uh, basically known for islands. The section from Lynchburg is the islandy section. Um, the Upper James is known for beautiful mountain views. As you break through, you start to get different uh, view sheds, different things that are pretty about the James. And then, of course, from Richmond um, down to the bay would be the lower. So, And then one thing that's been really big for the last couple of years has been the muskie. I think mm -hmm. the James, if you pull up any magazine, any article, they talk about the muskie fishing in the James. And I would, I, I would dare say it's probably a world destination for muskie this far south. Mm -hmm. Um, like yeah. how's the musky fishery been? So it's a very, very unique setup. I, the, when growing up, I didn't think the river was cold enough to hold musky. I never thought that it, the, they would hold. Uh, they started stocking them a number of years ago. I'm not exactly sure. It could be even as much as 20 years ago in the upper James. So right at the town of Glasgow, just before it starts to punch into the uh, Blue Ridge Mountains is where they stocked them. So they tracked those over the years and they started finding them down around Lynchburg. And if you know, a lot of folks, your listeners won't know, but between Glasgow and Lynchburg in the Blue Ridge Mountains, there are seven dams um, between that section. I did not know that. <laughs> yeah, seven. <laughs> and they end right at the, basically the face of downtown uh, Lynchburg is the last dam. Huh. And they have tracked the those musky coming over those dams for years. They've been jumping it? They, they've just been flowing over it in high water events. Wow. Or, or normal water events, whatever event. They're just coming through the dam, um, over the dam, most likely. And they're not making their way through the turbine, I don't think, because they're <laughs> big fish. But um, but either way, so now what we have, interestingly enough, so the Upper James, let me, before I leave that, is a fantastic fishery. And they've been stocked in there for years. Um, they've actually stopped stocking them in the Upper James because the population is at a good carrying capacity at the moment. From my understanding, they've stopped mm -hmm. stocking them up there. Um, but they're, so the fish in the Upper James, the water's colder. They are fewer and farther between. They spread out a whole lot more. They've got about 70 miles to spread out in that Upper James. The fish tend to grow bigger. The bigger musky are in the Upper James. They're, they're kind of truly the fish of 10,000 casts in the Upper James. They're hard to find in the Upper. That's why getting a guide, Blue Ridge Musky or, or some of those other guides that kind of know those sweet hot honey holes can get you right to them and, and make sure you're, they're, you're throwing something that they'll be interested in. Um, so the bigger ones grow in the upper James, but uh, they make their way, of course, as I was saying, over all of the dams. And we have a unique setup at the city of Lynchburg now, which would be the start of the middle, the end of the upper, where all of these muskie have made their way over these dams. They have no way to return because there are no fish ladders on any of these dams. Mm -hmm. So now we actually have a pretty incredible muskie fishery right in front of the city of Lynchburg, right that in front of so downtown Lynchburg. Cool. <laughs> you could just go sit on the bank right at the dam of downtown Lynchburg and, you know, you're, you're pretty likely to probably catch a fish. There's a few good boat access points. That's actually where my office is, is uh, at the, right across the face of downtown Lynchburg at a place called River's Edge Park uh, in Madison Heights, Virginia. Great boating access point there. Um, you know, you don't want to bring a, your your fiberglass boat. You want to definitely make sure you're bringing a boat that's that's ready for shallow river, um, but uh, very accessible to get in there and turn that fish of a ten thousand cast into maybe a fish of a couple hundred casts. <laughs> Can you believe that though? Like like downtown Lynchburg, you could probably like get a guide and then just smoke a forty to fifty inch musky. I know for a fact wild. there's uh, one of my favorite guides, Eric Campbell, operates pretty much strictly right there. That's that's his zone, and he he will, is almost guaranteed to put you on a fish. Yeah. That, how do you handle this massive area? That's insane. Like you're, you're yeah. like, how does that work? So you really, know? you know, uh, luckily we have good partnerships with all the localities. So from Lynchburg, we've got some fantastic partners. The County of Amherst is the same way. As we look back upriver, the city of Lexington, Buchanan, uh, Clifton Forge and others, we, we've through the years cultivated good relationships with them to help out where we can um, spread, spread, of course, good, uh, good programming and stuff that we're doing in those areas. Our education program 
has just absolutely exploded over the last several years. Uh, we're educating close to 15,000 kids a year in wow. the James, and that's all kids that are going on the river, paddling with us. It's, it's through your organization? Through, through the James River Association, yes, sir. Uh, and we, we, we partner with the school, local schools. We write grants together to get the funding to get the kids awesome. out of the classroom really, really cool. and out there. So so really between that, the great partnerships that we have up and down the river and just our, our vast volunteer network. Um, we've been around since the mid-70s, so we've got, we've got a, a, a pretty good basis. We started as the Lower James River Association due to some, some issues that we can, we can talk about those kind of as we make our way down river. Mm -hmm. Um, but started started there and it just have grown ever since. And our volunteer network is, you know, 500 some plus volunteer active volunteers, not just people who have come to a cleanup and said we're leaving. Uh, we belovingly call them our river rats. We have <laughs> trainings every year where we we not only give them the, the tools to uh, about you know places to access, meet uh, resources to use to find how to get on their waterways near them, what to look for, how to report it. Um, how to go about it safely, uh, all those things. So, so are you guys fishing mainly? Uh, you mentioned jet boats, basically jet boat, like I'm sure canoes and kayaks. Oh, absolutely, like canoes waiting. and kayaks. So you waiting? Yeah. And mm -hmm. with the dam structure too, that divides you up even more because it does. Um, yeah. You know, that kind of you can't do a continuous float, so you're. It's it's a real we we would love to see at some point would be great to see those dewatered and we would have something along akin to the New River Gorge now whether it would wow. be as bodacious as the New River Gorge we're not sure but wow. it would there's a few spots in there from from historical record that we know there were some pretty considerable falls really um, yeah I mean it's probably underneath a lot of the dam structure now huh. um, but yeah there's it would be a very beautiful paddleable section with some great class three rapids and stuff through them so That's very interesting awesome. could you yeah. explain for the audience what dewatered means. Dewatered, yeah, and that's <laughs> that would be, well, actually, this does happen sometimes. So when a dam dewaters, uh, they are lowering the level of the pond behind the dam for some kind of maintenance, whether it be to their own facility, or to um, to the, the maybe landowners, property owners want to work on some docks or something like that. Hmm. Some some of the facilities have partnerships or an agreement with the landowners to drop the or dewater it in some cases, but generally they want to keep that that level high because that's what it gives them the ability to run that water through so that they can make the money that they do off of the procedure. So, um, interesting. It's okay. a little bit more predictable when they can keep it that way, but it would, it would have to be some sort of maintenance or an inspection, some sort of inspection. They needed to look at a certain part of the dam. So they would let it, let it down as much as possible. That is fascinating. That yeah. all that is just so fascinating. And, and to be honest, it's a really tricky situation because none of the dams really have much communication with each other. They're all different entities, different companies. Mm. So the right hand doesn't really know what the left hand is always up to. So mm. you do a huge, now in that case where they're dewatering an entire facility, the folks downstream would probably get word of that. But as far as the flows, uh, you know, changing from their, their daily usages of the river, however, they're kind of, of tweaking their operations. The next guy then has to retweak his, the next person has to retweak theirs. So it's a, it's an interesting situation. And by the end of it, you know, we we get what's left coming out at the bottom. And you were talking about the effect on species, mm -hmm. and that's where you really truly see it, is is that when you've got, you know you should have a certain water level coming out, which really on our, in our case should never be less at Lynchburg than 800 cubic feet per second. Um, and you see it sometimes get down to 600. And, and these facilities upstream are actually allowed to hold it down to 300 cubic feet per second um, in, in like a drought time of year. That's that's what they're allowed to hold the river back to. So uh, and then you've got areas that were once aquatic habitat that's now just dried up and, and all those those critters that can't move very fast have then of course, just withered away up there. So, you know, it, it's it's something that's it's it's being looked at very closely by DWR, uh, at least on the James River. I'm sure in the Shenandoah, Kelby, and others have mm -hmm. have pushed it as well because it's a uh, it's a huge issue. You know, our that that's what our fishery relies on is those bugs in the bottom of the river. If we have no bugs, we have no fish, and we have, we all have no fun to go have. So, so you think they're pushing to just totally get or do away with the the. Uh the dam like that, I know that's done that um, on the north fork they got rid of one but it's the so there the there's always freely. the potential um but they're all privately owned oh, so okay. um and and a lot of them are still in function uh one of the main ones is owned actually by uh, another georgia pacific facility uh, okay. right there in big yeah. island is another one kind of um, unlikely but yeah. kind of unlikely uh the but the there are a few that have come up for sale in recent years and been resold so the trick would be to buy one and mm -hmm tear it out <laughs> we just yeah. need to come up with a couple million dollars to to buy one outright and then you can do whatever you want with it so 
Yeah. What kind of bottom? Like I know there's Shenandoah, there's a lot of ledges and is it yep. a similar type of rock bottom or? Yeah. Oh, the geography, the geology of the James just changes considerably um, as you go. Now, when you're in the upper, it's mostly rocky cobbly bottom with your several bedrock ledges poking up. It'll go from an eight foot deep pole to a two inch, two inch deep because you've got your bedrock coming all the way up out of nowhere. So mm -hmm. it varies greatly, especially with the bends in the river. Mm -hmm. You're turning with the angle of the, of the, the actual uh, substrate. Um, and it's really a whole geology project to really look closely at the bottom of the James River as you move your way through. It's fascinating to see the difference in the rocks change as you move, especially all the way from, from Jackson River down towards like the Richmond area. Um, but as you start to make your way down the James, our biggest uh, economic, or excuse me, environmental problem starts to show its face a little bit, and that's sedimentation, the sediment in the river. I'm sure it's no strange, y'all are no stranger to seeing that up here in the Shenandoah and probably in the Potomac as well. Um, but that's when you start to see a little bit more sandy bottoms. Um, and uh, and they start to, the water the water just starts to, to smooth out a little bit flatten out a little bit there's not as much flow to kind of keep that stuff moving mm -hmm. so it all starts to settle and deposit you still have rocky areas lots of shoal areas still in that middle James section there are, are tons of shoals from from in that 160 mile section from Lynchburg to Richmond um, but you will find in some of those slacker spots a more sediment filled bottom yeah mm -hmm. yeah. How much of an issue then is is runoff, like whether it's from farming or construction? Does does James suffer from that at all? Yeah, truly, truly, and that's uh, I think really it's it's even larger. And as I was coming up here, reading, going over all the rivers, you see Chesapeake Bay watershed, and I love it, and then as and we see those in the James also, and we have the James River watershed in there too. Sediment is truly the biggest issue facing the entire Chesapeake Bay. It, it really is the biggest problem river river wide if you go from all the way at the lower the lowest one which is the james the, the last uh tributary if you go south to the chesapeake bay all the way up to the susquehanna it's that by far the biggest pollutant to the james now the reason is is that as it runs off it can carry kind of junky stuff with it it can bring nitrogen phosphorus all those things are great on land it grows plants that's what we want but once it makes its way into the river that's when you see extra algae growing um, the, the sediment itself has a few problems too. Not only does it fill in that rocky habitat, those cobbly bottoms where those little critters are living, um, and once they don't have any habitat to go hide under, they get picked off pretty quickly, and then they're not able to redo their their next generations, yada yada yada. Then you have a kind of a blank stream there as far as your your benthic macroinvertebrates, those little bugs that we're mimicking with all these lures for fly fishing and stuff like that. Um, and then the third one, which is habitat loss from a different standpoint, that sediment in the water has uh, prevents the sunlight from penetrating through. Mm -hmm. And if the sunlight can't penetrate and hit the bottom, then you're not getting your good underwater grasses yeah. that are supposed to be growing. And that not only is a food source for your fish, some fish species, but of course it's good hab hiding habitat mm -hmm. for your small fry of fish to make sure they get from that I've been born now. I need to grow into a, a five pound smallmouth. You know that 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 time in between, they need a place to hide. So, uh, sediment really does pose big issues all around. Is and, that because of erosion? And then yeah, like yeah, repair, erosion, and it can zones, I guess. As far yeah, as the yeah, and that's that's stuff, a lot of the work. Basic. Yep. Concept. You got it. Yeah. And wherever it's coming from, whether it be a, an open face construction site that wasn't properly mm -hmm. silt fenced around or a, a massive cattle field that's mm -hmm. had them walking in the creek for 50, for a hundred years, you know, right. there's, and that, that's a big part of the work that we're doing is, is livestock stream exclusion, planting those buffers, try to, mm -hmm. try to really get that filter strip, as we say, mm -hmm. along those waterways to just try to keep some of that dirt where it's mm -hmm. supposed to be. Um, you know, and, and from a production standpoint, from producers, especially coming up through the valley, I saw some beautiful farms coming up here. Mm -hmm. What makes those farms work is that great topsoil. Right. And if they don't have that great topsoil, they don't do what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. You'd rather keep it where it's supposed to be than send it down the Shenandoah River or down the down the James River. Yeah. Explain to that for the people at home, what's so important about the topsoil exactly? Well, you know, you're you're building up an organic layer when you're when you're a farmer, you're you're whether you're a, a cattle farmer, sheep farmer, pig farmer, um, if, if you're an, if you're a livestock farmer, then you're truly a grass farmer. You're just growing grass. That's what your animals yeah, are eating. So whether you're growing grass or you're growing corn or you're growing soybeans or anything else like that, that organic layer uh, in your soil allows it to grow, of course, your crops to grow much better, but you don't have to do as much artificial fertilizing because your organic layer is producing the, the nutrients that your, your crops will need. So as your topsoil builds up, you're building that organic layer, 
You have to apply less and less fertilizer every year. As the years go by, your costs, your profits seem to go up because my plants are growing well. I'm spending less on fertilizer. So it's just, it's all a plus benefit for the, produ for the producer. Um, whereas if you strip that topsoil, let it all run into the Shenandoah or run into right. the James River, you've then lost all that organic material and all that organic uh, layer, which of course has bugs and critters and worms and all that stuff in there too. Um, you've lost all that and you're, you're artificially putting that back every year. So you might have dirt, but you don't have any nutrients left in it. So you then so have to come back and put the, nitrogen and phosphorus and potash and all that stuff back on the soil that you've let right, yeah. run off. So the, the old way of farming was you would let, you would allow that, or it would just end up, the topsoil would run off and then you would have to supplement that with artificial ways of, of simulating mm. topsoil, yeah. correct? B believe it or not, the old way we kind of we we're kind of going back to the a little bit of the old ways because the old way was rotating you your rotating crops. your crops but not really doing too much disturbance of the soil when you replace that crop okay you're you're well, you're like putting a no -till it in it's a it's basically base, it's no till is exactly what it is hmm. and then about in the you know around when we started getting tractors and we started doing big production farming you know, it was, it made sense to just tear up all that ground because we need to do it quickly. We need to do it fast. We need to grow as much as possible. And now we kind of understand how much that can really strip away over time. Right. Oh, um, it's, okay. we've kind of going back to those no-till. So I saw several fallow fields coming up here that don't have any crop in it, but have just been replanted. And you couldn't hardly tell because they haven't been tilled up. They haven't gotcha. been turned over. They've been seed drilled. Mm -hmm. So they've drilled those seeds right into last year's crop. And that didn't turn over any excess soil. Nothing's different. That so when it rains, you're not getting a runoff that you would. Exactly. On a, exactly. Yeah, so would. really, and to be honest, to be honest the, the, the producers and the farming uh, 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 community is a, are a very sharp bunch. This is not lost on yeah, them. Yeah, right. And they, uh, they have responded pretty well. Now, you That's still got good. some hard case issues. Um, you know, every, every, you still get a few of this is how grandpa did it. So this yeah. is how I'm going to do it. But yeah. like um, you said, it's collaboration. And that's it's right. Good. It just it's, takes time. It's education too. Like, like you said, truly really there, that's their business. And I was thinking back to your paper mills and everything. That's revenue. That's income. That's income. That's their yeah. Livelihood. And so how do you, it's jobs you for people. Live, how can everybody live in the same area in the same space? True. And live together and, and find that equilibrium and balance. Absolutely. You know, system. Are you all seeing also, I know all oh, that's wild too, because that's the same issues that we face here or you hear about. What about, like I know around here too with our river, it seems like with growth of, you know, population in condensed areas and water, water source, you know, we're seeing on average, it seems as if our water levels are a lot lower because I think we're drawing out of that river. You got more houses, more homes, more showers, more, you know, sure. people flushing toilets mm -hmm. and stuff. So is that, you're all seeing the same thing as far as the growth or no? Yeah, I mean it's it's definitely more pressure. Yeah, as we as we add more folks and, and especially too, you know, there's a kind of an untold piece of the story here with our all of this urban growth and we have uh, in, impermeable surfaces. Basically, water can't soak back into the water table in some of these places. It's right. running off at a faster rate through our rivers. So, kind of early on, you see kind of a higher we we were seeing kind of higher river levels on average. Mm -hmm. That's because we were getting more of that that water that didn't soak in. But now as we're going through, we're just seeing that the aquifers aren't quite rejuvenating as well as they used to. Um, not that this is happening overnight. We've had these cities around for a long time, so this circumstance has probably been happening for a right. long time. But um, just something to think about. You know that that we want that water to soak in, and and that's that's something that is very important when we're talking about farms and producers. Mm -hmm. I'd much rather have a piece of land be a farm field than Correct. a shopping center a house <laughs> or a housing yeah. comp, yeah. you know, yeah. so That's whereas, right. you know, there's a lot of, of issues that come from, from some, some of the farming practices, yeah. much rather see it be a farm than, a, than something else. So well, you mentioned earlier that there's a strip, a buffer strip. Could you explain that a little bit more? Cause I think this is fascinating when you look at Lake Frederick or maybe a deep Creek Lake that it seems like there is some kind of buffer there mm -hmm. between it, but then you look at a Lake Anna or a Lake Norman in the Carolinas, mm -hmm. and it looks like there's a Walmart that backs straight up to the, right. to the right. what, what is the purpose of that? Just so people understand. Sure, at home. sure. And it's and a, a, another thing too to, that's pretty important to note is that none of this is is state mandated. Um, there are a few when it comes to really? logging practices. Like if you're going to be logging, you do now have to make sure you're leaving a strip of at least 50 to 100 feet uh, away from the water source that you're not touching. Um, so that is one restriction. But as far as a farmer or a land owner or anything you were free to cut trees right up to the water's edge if you'd like you can have mowed grass right up to the water's edge if you'd like hmm. but 
Is that the best thing for the water? No, it's not. You, that filter strip or what we call the, or what is called the riparian buffer zone riparian is buffer a strip zone. of at least ideally about a hundred feet um, between the edge of the water and whatever land use that you're using upland. And that would be uh, a mixture of trees, shrubs, grasses that provides a, a vegetation strip along the edge of the water that's going to try to catch pollutants as it comes towards the waterway. So sediments, it will kind of grab those particles of dirt and hopefully they'll settle back into the ground. Likewise, with all the things that ride along with it, like the, the nitrogen and the phosphorus and all that stuff, um, will kind of will be filtered out and the water will pass through and go on to the, to the waterway as it normally would. Um, and so that's the idea. Now, yeah, like Smith Mountain Lake, you got a lot of beautifully manicured lawns right, right up to the lake's yes. edge. You know, you've, you've, got, you've got spots on the river that are like that too. So um, it's at this point a voluntary process. And to be honest, uh, in some of these private settings, you know, whether we're talking about country clubs or, you know, that are just along lakes and ponds and creeks all across the state, or we're talking about some of these new developments that are going in, you know, the, the farmers are getting a lot of unfair blame mm -hmm. for this, right. you know, and because there's a lot going on that's, uh, that are major projects that are having huge impacts and, and not necessarily all on the farmer's backs. That, that's a good point that I really hope you could bring more uh, clarity to. Why is it the farmers? always got the short end of the stick like especially when we've had shelby on or or, or any of our guys from the dwr or our shenandoah river keepers talked about it. it's always the farmers got blamed for the shenandoah fish kill mm -hmm. um but it seems like that's that's probably unfair yeah well it's you, you know it, it's really hard in some cases to to draw an accurate line to say okay now we're now we've crossed over to it's this person that's more of the issue or this person it's like a blame game type it, of thing. it is it's it's a tough one um and the, i guess the the farmers and the producers when it comes to the visual aesthetic of things, when you're riding around and you're yeah, looking sure. to see where could this come from, and it's it's what we call point and non-point source pollution. So if I can point at something and say, hey, I see a bunch of muddy water coming off of this farm right here, that's a point source. I can point it in and say that. But a non-point source is when it's coming from everybody's yard in the city of Lynchburg or the city of of Winchester. Mm -hmm. It's it's the little bit from each person's yard, but when you look at the waterway coming out into the river, you have con you have communally made it crappy and made it look terrible. Whereas that farmer is just a victim of being the only one in that spot. Because mm. he's also a lot of times are right next to that water that creek. Where exactly. His point too is like you're like here, you take your all your drainage. Like you might not even be able to see the water. You don't even know where your drain is underground is going. You don't it's hidden. know where it's going to end up into that stream. It might be the Peckin Creek for us. It's going to end up in the river mm -hmm. or it might go into the river, but all those towns, that drainage is going to end up, there's going to be a pipe that's going to drop that mm -hmm. water into mm -hmm. a creek or, yep. and that's, and you don't, we as humans don't think about, it's like flushing your toilet. Yep. You don't know where that water's going. You yep. just flush it and it disappears. You don't yep. care where it goes. That's right. Yeah, and it's fascinating to me because like, I, I'll, I'll sheepishly admit it, like before I started doing this podcast, I was completely ignorant. And I always said like, well, of course it was the farmers, the, the mm -hmm. fish kill. And then you talk to a Mark, uh, you talk to Mr. Frondorf and he's like, so what do you think happens with all the ski resorts? Mm -hmm. And he's talking about wintergreen. It's like, oh shit, you're, I didn't, yeah, my mind was, I was like, yep, that's a massive runoff that goes to the river. Where do you think Absolutely. all the cities go? And it's like all these other things that I just, I wasn't aware of. Another one I wasn't aware of, pharmaceuticals. Like they yeah. take their drugs, yep. like, oh, I don't flush them. this medication. Well, mm -hmm. They flush it. Well, again, where do you think it's going? Now, how does that affect the reproduction, reproduction mm -hmm. cycle of, of a living organism? You know, it's Most like, we, again, to your point, we don't think about that. We, we don't. Do it without... and, and we're not educating people about, right. about all that, about what, whatever goes down your drain, where is it going to end exactly. up? You know, if, if you're going to, if you're going to, you know, change the oil in your car, don't just throw it out in the yard or things yeah. like that. We're so far yeah. removed from, I mean, back in the day, you, you, you were, I think, more tied to mother nature and, and the mm -hmm. environment, you know, just mm -hmm. because now, because yeah. we're, you know, we got these. Like you said, it runs underground sometimes. Yeah. It's out of sight yeah. in a lot of cases, and it's easy to be kept out of sight. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, yeah, it's it's truly troubling. Mm -hmm. It really to to uh, you know we can we can talk about farmers and producers all night. I would think I would venture to say that there are no there's no one group of people that have done more to help waterways than the farmers. Than the farmers. Oh, yeah. Because good, when you right? think about municipalities, that's all municipal money that's coming together. And sure, there's a lot of good plans that have happened. People have done a lot of hard work in a lot of these places, especially wastewater treatment plants. We've seen vast improvements in those. Mm -hmm. But as, as, a, as a group of citizens in the mm -hmm. state, I would say producers and farmers have done just as much, if not more, than anybody. That's good to know. Now, there are still some bad actors now, sure. to, to be at that end. There's a lot of work left to be done. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And when I say bad actors, again, like you said, it's maybe just, it's just, they don't know. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a, it's an education thing. Yeah, you're right. So, <laughs> excuse me. Something that people are going to really want to know is, uh, and we've talked about this agnosium on the show is the Shenandoah issues with the smallmouth and the fish kill. Has the James River ever experienced anything like that happened to Shenandoah? Or are we just special up here? No. Uh, yeah. I mean, you've, um, you know, we have had some in the past. Yes, for sure. And actually that's, that's really why our organization started 40 years ago, 50 years ago now getting close, um, was, uh, was because of that. The lower James, the key pone issue was getting into the fish and, and really eagles was our, was our big keystone species that really was the most affected by the whole process. The eagles would eat the fish that had, mm. had, had picked up eating all the little bugs that had key pone, little bits of key pone inside their bodies all that bio accumulated in the fish and other fish, the blue fish, blue catfish and other fish were eating those fish and it just accumulated in the fish bodies themselves. And the key pone's a toxin, correct? Key pone is a toxin, yeah, that was, that was used in the creation of DDT. So, you know, big nasty stuff for bugs and it just does riddles your 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 neurological system, your endocrine system just mm. is totally va uh, waxed by it. But uh, what was happening with the eagles, it actually didn't affect the adult eagles. That really didn't affect them at all, but it affected their egg production. And when they when they laid their eggs, their eggshells were so soft that when they laid on them to incubate them, they would crush them. And so wow. we lost a whole generation of, of eagles for 15, 20 years on the Lower James. So that was our keystone species. Um, and we've had some small kills up and down the river uh, ever since. Um, but, you know, when we're seeing water temperatures rise, when we're seeing, uh, you know, drought conditions, we have seen some stress level uh, events happening a little bit more often. Um, we had a, actually two fish kills last year on some smaller creeks that I went and assessed and I really couldn't come up with a good, good solution other than just too little and water and the water's too warm, um, for these types of species of fish. And so, um, now I'm not exactly sure with the background of what happened with the smallmouth on, um, on the, on the uh, um, Shenandoah, but would, I would have to think that it would take extremely low levels of dissolved oxygen, which means hot water pretty much, um, because you've got plenty of rapids to replace that oxygen. So it must be hot, hot water or something up with the pH. Uh, so which means there's either too, something too acidic or something too basic in the water. That's the, the immediate things that would snap a fish like that. And so uh, you've got Kelby and others that are all over that. So I'm not exactly sure mm -hmm. where, where that came from, but, um, yeah, those issues can pop up at any day. I mean, we saw what happened to East Palestine. I mean, we got the, the train tracks running a little right beside oh, the James River for 300 oh, plus gosh. miles. We've had a train derailment in Lynchburg. We had a huge explosion. You could really, oh, absolutely. This was when I first started about six, about almost 10 years ago uh, in 2014. Day one, you got pretty much call. day one. Yeah. And my office was in my current office. There were people running out of, I was off site at the time running out of the office in fear for their life because they thought the building was going to catch them on fire and nobody knew about it because nobody died um and wow. it fell in the river most of it burned it was the stuff at the time was coming from the dakotas so it was that real natural gas laden stuff so it was just highly highly flammable so most of it burned caused a huge fireball the water the river was at flood stage at the moment when it happened so really there was no long lasting effect yeah it was a it kind of pumped all that stuff down. It was real light crude, so none of it really sank or made tar balls or anything like that. So really, we just dodged a bullet. But I mean, these massive things are, could happen at any moment. I mean, you uh, the one of the fish kills that we uh, that we inspected, one of the localities, uh, they were putting one of their treatment chemicals into their treatment facility. Well, one guy forgot to turn the valve off, and so it starts overflowing and going into the creek. Oh my gosh! And it is, it was a, it was a fish kill because somebody had forgot to turn a valve off. So when you have this infrastructure so close to these waterways, something's bound to happen. Human error happens all over the yeah. place. No, much not to mention uh, uh, acts of God with weather. I mean, and all that going on, you can have infrastructure get undermined by rainstorms. I mean, there's just the list goes on and on. Not much different. <laughs> Not uh, in any, yeah. No. I mean, immune systems and, and defense systems, and then we're all we're always exposed to bacteria and viruses, and the fish are no sure. different. And sure. so, like what he's saying too is very true. Of once uh, those are compromised, if you will, they're more susceptible than to those things. And sure. so, you know, some it's just it's mother nature sometimes, and sometimes we do cause it. But like you're saying, yeah. sometimes we don't. I mean, it's, yeah. 
There, there's a lot at play. A lot and, of factors and variables. And that's really what it comes down to when there is so much going on, you know, that, that could affect this stuff. It's It comes down to, well, we need to impact it the least amount as we possibly can to, you know, as a whole, you know, each each person doing their part to try to to try to help the whole thing. It still amazes me though how knowledgeable these guys are. Oh, they yeah. Are like, it's absolutely guys, amazing. You guys are brilliant. Yeah. Like, I'm, and I'm not just saying that, like. Everyone we've ever had mm-hmm. on, your your mind is just incredible. And, and I hope mom's watching. Mom, did you hear that? That's right. <laughs> no, you know, seriously, though. No, I mean, scientific and just the, and it's it's a simple it's simple mm-hmm. to very complex, but it's just in how you yeah. just bring bring all that together. To me, is just fascinating. Yeah. Um, and and the name cool. is so perfect, like the keeper of the, you are yes. the keeper of the rivers, yep. like it, just the knowledge that you guys have on this thing. And it's because it, even uh, like Halliker even like, like mm-hmm. messaged me when I did the market was like, that was really awesome. Cause like, mm-hmm. there's like that connection there mm-hmm. between the river keepers and the DWR That's right. yeah. and it's all just so fascinating to me. Like, and this is stuff that needs to get out in the open and people yeah. need to know about just to be able to keep these. Cause like, the, you know, a river is an artery and it mm-hmm. will pick up anything. And, and mm-hmm. so when you think, think of it that way. Everything yes. that a river flows through, it's going to get into that river, whether it's Lynchburg, whether it is runoff from a farm, any of that mm-hmm. stuff. And you just got to be really thoughtful when you go out there mm-hmm. to keep this stuff. If you see something, say something. I think Jeff Little said that. One, huge shout out to Jeff Little. Um, said that about the Susquehanna. It's like right. If you're floating and you see something that looks mm-hmm. weird, take a picture mm-hmm. of it immediately and then you can send it to them. Worst case, they'll be like, eh, it's no problem. Mm-hmm. Or you might be the first person to capture something that's like really important mm-hmm. that needs to be brought to the attention. And it does require people that go out in the water, whether it's guys or just, you know, a, a dumb YouTuber like mm-hmm. me, or if you're just going out and fishing with your family, mm-hmm. see something, say something. Mm-hmm. So it can be brought to awareness. Well, kudos to you too. And fishing the DMV because, and I remember in here, like we would feel a lot of those questions of like during that time, like what the heck is going on? And I, I still remember guys mm-hmm. like, Oh, we can go to the moon and, you know, put a man on the moon. We can take rock <laughs> off of Mars, but we can't, but, but what they don't realize, they didn't realize, were in connections with the biologists of them talking about even the the uh, this year's class and like a six or seven year, like if if you have high water, low water. Mm-hmm. You know, we like need to talk about saying, that too. Yeah, spawning, yeah, spawning habits, and then you know, like we we don't see the effects of that for six or seven years as far as that good nice citation bass that we like catching. Sure. But that information and knowledge is, and it's still a lot of times doesn't get, there's no bridge between you guys and the state guys and the, the everyday angler. And right. this, this kind of format, mm-hmm. this communication education, I think, and what was last thing I'll say to you about that is like, just like you and they, the experts, the professionals are also outdoorsmen and anglers and you're, you say you're a keeper of the river, but you also enjoy it. And that's why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah, right. Because you want to protect that resource for future generations. Truly. Yeah. yeah. And that's that's why we support just any old thing that gets people by the water, whether it's bird watching or mm-hmm. watching your kid paddle or if it's fishing. I mean, right. you want to, we, we want people to develop a, a love for the waterways right. for Amen. whatever reason that may be. Right. If you love something, you want to protect it. And yeah, it's, it's right. just that simple. So, yeah. awesome. How have the uh, how has the rain consistency been this year in the past years for high water, low water events? Because I know we we've talked at nausea about that in the Shenandoah about you need mm-hmm. having a lot of rain in that late April May ish area is not always the best it's thing brutal. for smallmouth spawn. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's really the that is the exact same story for the James too. Really? It's it's so crucial that they have that time a year to with relatively calm water to do their thing, and then the water can go crazy after that. If it wants to or before that right, right. but they need that window of time and with our spring rains i mean i'm a big morel hunter too actually mushroom hunter i've oh, been cool. out looking for some morels here recently i was kicking around the woods yesterday the evening and just it was incredibly dry it's mm-hmm. for this time of year it's incredibly dry mm-hmm. we've got rain coming this weekend rain's going to come but generally march and april we're you know usually those rainy times of years and and you know this way with our winter this year we too it seems like our we didn't have much snow melt and our winter kind of came in march mm-hmm. so it seems like everything's just sliding back mm-hmm. a little bit and mm-hmm. tragically for the smallmouth bass that's not good mm-hmm. because if we do get rains further pushed further further back in the year it's just going to perennially put that right into their spawn time um so 
really, and there's, there's not a lot that can be done. There's really nothing that can be done about that. Um, other than to hope and pray that they get the weeks that they need to do what they do. But, um, but you're right. You can totally, you know, tell all years, Oh, I, I didn't catch but one five pounder this year. Well, look at the rainfall to- data from six years ago and yeah. see, and see what it was. Yeah. Oh, here's your small mouth fishery. So we've, we've seen it go up and down. We saw a little bit of a bounce back last year because we had a kind of a drier spring awesome. and we didn't have a high. Uh, so we, we anticipate a good spawn last year. Um, we had some pretty good returns. It's another interesting thing. DWR comes to shock um, in our section of the river a lot because those muskies are right there to get to, to get the spawn to put in other rivers and, and to not spawn, but to get the stuff they need to take to the hatchery to do the things that they do there. Um, but they come to our area a lot. And so we see them shocking up fish all the time. And we have seen uh, a little bit of improvement for the last three years. We've actually seen the numbers going up. Four, four or five years ago was the lowest we'd seen it in any of the time we've been looking either. So, you know, it just goes back and forth. It's yeah. variable. But four years ago, we had, you know, the, the most rainfall that we've ever had in the city of Lynchburg since we've been measuring it since 1888 or something like that. Wow. So 1898. So there you go. We had crazy yeah. rainfall. We had no, right. no, no spawn. So yeah. it can almost be directly correlated to that. And when it comes to, it makes it that much harder when you kind of find what the problem is, but you can't really do anything. There's about nothing it. you can do There's about nothing that. Nothing you can do to fix it. Does supplemental stocking ever weigh into that? Is that something you guys ever thought about? Like that could help at all? You know, we haven't heard a lot about that for at least for bass or smallmouth bass. Um, but I think that that, that always, could always be an option. It really could. But the, we haven't heard that from the DWR guys. I think because this, it, it has the potential to turn on a dime when they have the right conditions. Yeah. You know, there's going to be kind of less of them. So food storage, habitat, all of that, well, they'll have in spades. So when they do start, it's going to be gangbusters. But um, and I think they're worried about I think stocking in general is something that is has to be looked at pretty precisely because it's a pretty heavy investment from the state mm-hmm. and uh, making sure that they're putting those efforts into places that they're going to see a good success rate. Mm-hmm is important. Um, and from what I know now, the, the, the stocking that the state does is a, is stretched pretty thin, you know, from the, from your muskie to your, uh, to your, all the way up to your trout, you know, is they, they run a pretty thin line to make sure that they get everything put out there. So if anything, we just need more money for them. And that's, that's, one of the things we advocate for in the general assembly more money for for all these programs. and that's the other thing too is fascinating when i got to go see um yeah mr mccrickard and uh Benarski, uh they they're part of the dwr i got to go down to richmond and talk to them and and there's so many i call it doc talk and it's like example is like one topic i'm trying to find is bow fishermen and, you know doc talk is bow fishermen out there they're drinking they're shooting your dog bass everything <laughs> and like most of the rumors i hear or the comments are wrong Right. And one of them is like, you know, it's all the money that the DWR gets is is from the Fed and that's where it comes from. And then you realize like, well, that's not true at all. So it's like, then how is there this disconnect where it's like this mass populace thinks one thing and then, but this is actually how it is. And like, how do we bridge that gap to be like, no, if you want your rivers and lakes to be better, it's like, it does take you guys to either buy a fishing license or help donate or this or that. And it's so yeah. weird. It's like, well, this is the truth. But this is what a lot of people think. It's yep. just, it's fascinating to me. I was blown away when I found out they weren't part of the state budget. It blew, blew, I was blown away. I had no clue. It's like, what do you mean they're not part of the state budget? And yeah, it's all fishing licenses, hunting licenses, boat registrations. That's that's what keeps them working. You hmm. just made me realize, too, that it's funny because and you talk again, we always talk about the map, but the amount of water and like in the miles of water. It's so it's like, if, like, for example, I'd be like, we've we got to put these small mouths in Shandow, but you're going to say, let's put them in James. <laughs> Dude's going to want. And so, yeah. too, when you think about mm-hmm. miles of rivers, yep. okay, and there's only so many, you only have so many, you're right. So, how do you, where do you allocate that, right? Yeah. And then Who I gets think it? you got to base that on what is your current population. This yeah. is healthy. So, let's, you know, I, that is, that's, and so it's easy for us to say, well, you just do this, but mm-hmm. it's not so easy when you put everybody at the table and yep. where, where's it going to be. And then we got to talk about facilities for 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 the fish themselves because then you'll have to say okay well if we want to do smallmouth do we want to get rid of doing the musky do we want to get rid of doing some of the trout or do we make a new facility to do the bass because then you know that's a couple several millions of dollars so it's a lot was goes into question. it i know they're doing they're doing a great job of uh you know just as far as marketing and different things but that was my my question always too is like if you broke the dollar down and or like and I know a lot of us too will we'll trout fish and smallmouth fish and but you know what percentage of your licensing fees are yeah. going towards like 
almost like a you like, a trout stamp so you yes. know who bought a trout yeah who yeah. bought ba- a bass stamp something like that could, yeah. i don't know i don't know how to do that or if there is a good way to do that interestingly but. enough i would guess and this is all a guess it probably is close to what you're investing in so like you're mm-hmm. you're doing your 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 fishing license mm-hmm. you know that's going to go most likely to it's probably just easier for them to sort that money that way right like true hunting hunting licenses you go to more of the conservation beliefs mm-hmm. you know whatever you know whatever that goes to yeah so and that's the other thing too you brought up a good point is conservation and just the, not all that money is allocated to fish i mean here we are we're, we're biased to fish but you yeah know, oh yeah it's got to go to everybody things out there that they need to in their budget you yeah know, right or wrong i mean look at the elk you know they brought yeah, you know, sure, i was talking sure. about that i think it's this do not quote me on this guys in the comment section it's either this year or next year the elk tags are going to be a it's going to be a lottery for elk tags i think but that's mm-hmm. like how many years going back mm-hmm. was that a work in progress mm-hmm. to get to that point mm-hmm. um you know and we're on the thing of money like how does how does the riverkeeper organization how do they fund themselves yeah a lot of it's donation based so we're we're a a, um, a a member organization our organization is so you can you can be a member every year and a residual member to donate Uh, But a lot of our programming that we look at, especially like our buffer programs, our education programs, those very specific programs, we actually will do a lot of grant writing um, to get that to get that funding and lined up. Um, There's a lot of good sources out there. We have if you're an an organization out there that's trying to grow and get bigger and you get more money, get a good grant writer. That's (laughs) that's, and if you find one, don't let them go because they can be the your organization have lots of resources to do what they do, what you like or to do what the mission is or you're scraping the bottom of the barrel. Hmm. And that that's um, an interesting kind of caveat, but um, but yeah, that's uh, we're all different. So um, Kelby and the and the Shenandoah Riverkeeper may be a little bit different, but I'd venture to say they're very close. Member member funded a lot. Um, and for example, with our buffer program, the Virginia Outdoors Foundation is a huge uh, funder of us for that. So um, we we've got a few different pots of money that we that we look into uh, to to grow, and it's 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 truly important. Uh, we have we have people that are not the biggest of outdoors people. We have people that actually don't can't stand being outside camping and on the river, but they're great accountants and mm-hmm. they're great fundraisers. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, they have a place, you know, because they, they keep us doing what we, what the, what, what we know to do and which is not so great at fund raising funds and doing other things, but we're good at talking to folks and educating and, um, getting out on the water. So how much do you get to get out on the water? Um, not as much as I'd like to, um, but, um, probably uh, 75, 80 days professionally a year. Yeah. And more than that. Uh, a lot of our programming that we do with the high school students and we have some some programs where we get the public out on the river too um uh, they're they're of course very hands-on all guided so we need people all hands on deck we're a pretty large organization but in my office we only have four or two full-time staff members and two uh, part-time staffers and we'll educate close to you know close to 1500 kids alone out of our office then throughout the summer we do bateau trips so we do canoe and kayak trips uh, that we're getting the public out on the river. So we'll send several thousand people out on river trips to get them connected with the river. Um, so in that, we get to be on the water with them a lot too. So, and I'm a cap- the captain of our bateau. Do you all, you all familiar with a bateau? No. So it's a French word for boat for all those linguists out there in, uh, in YouTube world that are like, that just means boat in French. That's nothing fancy. <laughs> But uh, bateau, the James River bateau especially, uh, was a boat that was created to transport goods from, you know, kind of the, the farm fields down to the markets in Richmond. Were they taking them apart then? Like, was it? In some I cases. Know on the North Fork, in one of the books we have, they would they would manufacture the boat and they would ship the goods and then they got yep. down there, they would take that apart. They might build houses with it or whatever. Yep. But. Those, they did do that. In a lot of cases, those are what we know as go- what they're called gondolas. Yes. Okay. Yep. And those would have been taken apart. There you go. Uh, I might be in one of those pictures there. This is the James River Bateau Festival that you're seeing pictured here. This thing is so This is, uh, cool. so it's a four, generally about a 45, 50 foot wooden boat. Um, that's generally about six to eight foot wide. And we will navigate that big thing through all the shoals and shallow spots of 140 miles worth of trip down the James River. That is so cool. Uh, uh, just current, I guess, the right? front, uh, we actually, we you see the, the pull, see the, that one there? This is a great example. We've got a great picture pulled up. That thing on the front is actually called a sweep. Oh. And so you got one on the front and one on the back. Uh-huh. You use those to help navigate you and weave yourself through the rocky shoals. You use the flow of the current, but if the flow is not enough, and actually, for some navigation, you see the poles laying next to the box there. Right there. There's yeah. all those wooden poles. Oh, wow. Those are you 
you stick those into the ground at the front of the boat. If you're trying to get forward momentum, you shove it in oh your shoulder God. and you walk the length of the boat, pushing off the bottom of the river with that pole. That was like, a, was it? A, here's a blast in the past, like Davy Crockett and the River Pirates. Yes, Actually, that was one of my things. favorite movies growing yeah, up. <laughs> yeah, awesome movie. Yeah, and this is exactly this is the same thing. Very, yeah, those they called them keel boats in that movie. And on the Mississippi, they were called keel boats. That's but, so crazy. Yeah. That is yep. such a fascinating design. Like, so how much weight can they, like, generically can yeah. they hold? Yeah, a lot. So they they generally weigh themselves about 3,000 pounds, um, and they can carry about fourteen to 15,000 pounds worth of cargo. That is wild. Whether it be tobacco, pig iron. Tobacco would have been the big thing back in the day, mostly used for that. But they'd have been, the, now, so these are bateaus. These would have made, actually, the return journey home. These would have gone all the way to Richmond, and they would have pulled them back upstream really? before there was any canal. Absolutely, and pulled if you were pulled it using those I'll poles, pulled it, oh, pulled, pulled it, oh, pulled it. Pulled it. and also <laughs> if you, at certain rapids, if you were an entrepreneurial person, you would have a little team of horses at, at like a rapid, and maybe a several sets of ropes, and you would know how to get those boats up, and you would charge them when they came up. You'd charge them. I don't know, right. 50 cents or whatever the right. rate was back in the day. Wow. And you'd help them up that rapid. But there are many rapids where they just have to go up by themselves. They just have to work together. It's not so, like on the Potomac where you had the canal. Yeah. Where they could walk along the Before way. there was the canal, though, on the yeah. Potomac, they did it this way. Wow. Yeah, really? absolutely. This was the way it started on all these rivers. The, the Shenandoah likely had them flowing out of there at some point, too. I hate too. going down. You're talking about the, the job. I hate going down river and having to, like, I, drag I could, and I stuff. I could not like, imagine. I can't imagine going up yep. river. No, they weren't dumb. They wouldn't have gone in the middle of the August, they would have yeah, they so would have staged their boats and be ready to be. You to yep, you'd go with their spring rains and the fall rains, which is even more terrifying in some cases because the river's raging and you're rolling with this old rickety wooden boat. Is, is there any big history things from a non fishing perspective that people, I guess, websites I can link or anything big historically wise in this part of the James River that people might be fascinated to go visit? I know Lynchburg oh, this is a this big would place. be my biggest suggestion. So the Bateau Festival starts every year on Father's Day weekend. Starts in Lynchburg. It is an eight-day festival that floats from Lynchburg to Richmond. It is by far the coolest river festival on the planet. Not just the country. This is the coolest thing. The yeah, <laughs> you float, <laughs> and every <laughs> night we have we've got sites that are designated as our stop. So you'll camp. We'll all camp together. All the canoers, kayakers, all the boats. There should be about twenty bateaus this year. Twenty of the big wooden boats going down. <laughs> And we stop every night. You've got a campsite, porter potties. If you get there before dark, there's generally a food truck around. Um, but it is the best camping deal you will ever find. $25 for eight nights on the river with that's, campsite that's good and deal. your porter potties are all taken care of. Now it's, it's feeding us too? not feeding you. <laughs> you got to feed go. yourself. I'm, looking I'm at going to. Like, is that, can I store my lunch in there? Yeah. You my could, and, you oh. could. We certainly store lunches and maybe some other cool, cooler, cooler beverages too. That but are you're saying that for eight, so you're eight days on the, so you're, you're eight, seven, 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 seven nights days and camping. eight days. So you're yep. loading up all your camping gear and everything. We go 140 miles throughout the week. And Everybody brings their own camping gear. Bring your own camping gear. I'm all about it because we used to do that too. I mean, we camp along the river. Now, we a lot of the crews and well, some of the crews bring all their stuff on their boat. Um, but if you're a canoe or a kayaker, that's not reasonable. Gotcha. So th there's shuttles every day. People will get together and you'll make a lot of new friends shuttling. You meet the complete strangers. Like, hey, are you driving back to the put in? Can I have a ride? <laughs> and you'll hop on the back of somebody's truck with six other people and you'll <laughs> go, to the, go back to the beginning. But all this takes place out in the just the boondock country of the middle James. And really, the James River in the upper follows a lot of major highways. The James River in the middle is not the case. There's not very many major, major highways. Um, you're, it's just very rural, very large tracts of land. Like I said, lots of islands, just very bucolic, very scenic. Um, you've got a few little hamlets of towns where there used to be old river towns back in the day, Scottsville, um, okay. yeah, that you stop and we'll, we'll do just Your like the old, Near yeah, yeah, close to farm north of Farmville, Scottsville. Now, yep. This festival you speak of, is there, is there a way for those that don't, do the actual river activity to, to yeah. also participate. Yeah. In yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. You can just kind of follow along in the car yeah. and you know, most of the action is on the river. Gotcha. Um, but, uh, you know, we're always there in the mornings or there in the evenings 
you know, for the most part, sometimes we come in a little bit late, but, but f- just an incredible, That's incredible great. historic recreation still with just normal people. I mean, you, you guys could get a wild hair and go build a boat tomorrow and we might see y'all on father's day That's and, cool. and we welcome you with open arms. We'll help you get down. So. Here That's, so, yeah, That's right. Yeah, That's I right. I totally do this. Guys, link in the episode description of this festival and everything. So you can like, th- this is fascinating. So, like the history of the James Shindo and the Upper Potomac is so crazy. Uh-huh. We know about the, um, the Upper Potomac, the Shenandoah from the Civil War, things mm-hmm. like that. The James yeah. River. I mean, it's just, it's all so absolutely fascinating to it me. Is. Um, you got a really cool job. Yeah, the fact that, that you neat. get to do that, that is so cool. It's pretty, it's pretty neat. And that little section, we actually, if people are just looking to take a ride on the bateau, we offer them through the summer and we just do a short hour, two hour trip right in front of downtown Lynchburg. So oh. it's not the long drawn out trip down river, uh, but you get a chance to ride on the boat, pull it a little bit. You can run the sweep a little bit, see what it's like. And yeah, it's really neat. What's it's the really best neat. time to go to Lynchburg if someone wants to go vacation down that way? Go when, it's, when you can go outside, for sure, um, because there's just a lot of the, the town. Downtown has really grown. has gotten really awesome, um, and it's just something you want to kind of experience outdoor. You can just move from place to place outdoors. But it's uh, unknown of how close to the parkway, how close. Of course, you got the James River flowing right by, the Blue Ridge uh, Mountains running right through for hikes. I mean, all that stuff is no more than 30, 45 minutes away. And get Lynchburg College. Is it Lynchburg College? The name of it? There's a big college there in Lynchburg. Well, right? We've got Liberty is the Liberty. biggest. Liberty, okay. Yeah, and then University recently changed the name, which I just got used to, but University of Lynchburg, which used to be Lynchburg College. Okay. And then Randolph College is another one there. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, and, uh, amazing bike trails through the city too. The Blackwater Creek bike trail is amazing. I think it's something like 25, 30 miles of bike trails within the hmm. city. Um, kind of connects all the little boroughs through the waterways there. It's it's a neat place to visit. It's it's really come a long way. Um, and that wouldn't be something you could probably find a whole week's worth of things to do there. But you come for a long weekend, you'd absolutely find a way to fill your time. Yeah. It's a what fun about movie. anglers, like anglers that are listening? That that and what's what one thing we've always said too. We're so used to just doing our our places, fishing our areas that we know of. So mm-hmm. if folks are listening, because it's not too far from where we sit, uh, anglers that would like to get on the water, what mm-hmm. two or three places you'd recommend? Sure. To access uh, to get on that water to fish. Sure. Well, the the I, w- I will say the entire Upper James, uh, just because that first resource we were looking at, if you want to link that to the Upper James River Water Trail map, is an incredible resource. Really, the entire stretch you can't go wrong. Uh, that that will kind of tell you about trip links. It'll tell you about how much time, where the takeouts are, where the road networks are. Also highlights the Maury River, which is a fantastic fishery, and that's probably the closest. One of the closest to y'all as far as 81 goes. The Mari. Um, yep. And which is a great fishery also. Um, and th- that map will kind of key you in on all those places that you might be able to pop in, mm-hmm. do a short river trip, or just drive to and see if you can do some fishing there. Uh, the Middle James, uh, is a we don't have a, a great resource like this to, to allude to, um, but really uh, alluding to Google Earth, looking at the maps, anywhere where those rivers, are, those roads are crossing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I will say River State Park, if I had to key in on one place for the Middle James, is a is a good place where you can go that's pretty uh, that, that can set up a good campsite where you got a good campsite right on the river mm-hmm. you can fish at the park and it's a three mile park that goes along the river you can fish the whole corridor of the park mm-hmm. they can even help you set up a river trip to set you in mm-hmm. upstream to float down to your camp mm-hmm. um, it's it's really great so that's that's a great resource there uh, for the Upper James Twin River Outfitters, I meant to mention them. They're if you're looking to get out for a multi-day trip, they're the only guys to go to, and they're great. Um, but yeah, the middle James River State Park, wonderful friends there. Um, they do, a, a, and that's where the Ty River actually comes out into the James River. Beautiful, beautiful spot there. Very steeped in a lot of bateau history in that little spot. Uh, a lot of a lot of crashes have happened there hmm. <laughs> in the 250 years of them running the river. Um, um, yeah. A lot of tubers. We get a lot of tubers, like in front row, certain sections. Yeah, but. certain sections. Yeah, certain. The, that Upper James is a, is got some sections that are heavily tubed. And when you get close to uh, Scottsville, you'll see a couple liveries start up there, which is just south of Lynchburg of uh, Charlottesville. Um, but really, there's it's really kind of focused around a couple little urban centers. Mm-hmm. All that vast stretches in between. You don't see a whole whole lot. Maybe some private tubers that that know that sec their own little sections of river and will get out and do it. But um, not the massive uh, companies like you see sending them out. Yeah. Do the smallmouth differ in their habits in any other rivers that you've been on? Are they 
do they pretty much act the same way as they do on, let's say, the Potomac or the Shenandoah or the New or any other rivers that you've ever seen them in? Yeah, I, I haven't noticed a whole lot of difference in that, at least in my time fishing. Um, time of year, water temperature has seemed to be the biggest impact on their the, what they're doing. I've seen different looking fish, you know, based on like the, the bottoms of the river and what type of uh, aquatic environment they're really? living in. Oh, yeah, different patterns for sure. Uh, like on the, uh, just for instance, the tie, I was just talking about the tie, down in the James, they have a very tigerish the, the smallmouth have a very tigerish type look mm -hmm. to them whereas in the Thai um, there's a lot of darker geology stone through there the fish are almost black on mm -hmm. the back and their eyes are black the Thai on the Thai River yeah how many rivers yep. connect into the James it, it, it's the cow pasture the Jackson Murray the Maury and then you've got right. the peddler the the Thai the uh, Ravana the hardware the the more I even know about tons, any of this. Tons, yeah, the slate, <laughs> the, 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 yeah, there's, there's a ton I'm leaving out too. A lot of huge creeks too. Like, um, uh, um, oh gosh, why am I blank? Craig Creek. Craig Creek basically drains the entire county, Craig County, and mm -hmm. it's called a creek. But I remember it, just last year, the Craig Creek was running at 30,000 cubic feet per second. Wow. When the James gauge at the same place was only running at about 4,000 cubic okay. feet. So Craig Creek was running four wow. times as much as the as the main stem of the James. So look it's the, the creeks and the draws and the runs, all those names can be very deceiving. <laughs> uh crayfish, hogger mites, any mad toms? Uh yeah, in the upper for sure, mad toms. You see those a lot, um, especially like near uh when the, the sucker run happens like up on Jackson up near Potts Creek, you see a lot of mad toms uh in there. Um I mean, the other good feature too you keep you know, talking about is the trout too that mm -hmm. is like a different another species that we don't always see sometimes we see on the north but not not very much yeah yeah and then really those you got to go up into the headwater rivers you we don't i venture to say maybe once or twice i mean i'm sure it's happened that a stock fish has made its way down into the main stem of the james but it, it didn't last very long mm -hmm. yeah just whenever the temperature got too high it would have that would have been it for that but uh but yeah all those i mean really all the spines of both the blue ridge the uh the alleghenies all those are just littered with 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 trout streams mm -hmm. some stocked a lot native a lot of native stuff in there. I always try to, to be, now that I've got a chance to talk about native fishing for a second, it's one of those things you want to be very careful with um, just because native natives can be easily wiped off the face yeah. of this map if we if we all jumped into it too much uh -huh. and handle with care. Um, you try to crimp your barb down if you know you're catching little natives. You know, it's just a little simple thing. Try not to you know touch them with your hands, especially a dry hand, because you're going to wipe all that mucus layer off. And making sure you're doing it at the right time of year, because those are, those are probably the fish that are the that that have the that could probably be wiped out the fastest. Right, right. Yeah, just because you, I mean, they're in a creek that's no wider than this table, mm -hmm. and you know you could decimate them pretty quickly with with improper practices. So what um. And I'd be remiss if I have to talk about this a little bit, or I'm going to get nailed. Um, what are some of the issues when it comes to invasive species? Does the James suffer from any of that? So as far as fish species, uh, we we don't have the the big sexy ones like the snakehead and the, the spotted bass and stuff like that. We don't have any of those, but we do have some long-term uh, invasives that have kind of been hanging around. Uh, the blue catfish is really our biggest problem in the, James, in the lower James. Come up with an interesting solution to that and i think this is applies to the to the potomac as well hmm. um that's uh there are we have really pre done a full court press at the at the local state and government at, at a federal level to push for them to be more widely accepted for keeping and eating and selling them um by by fishermen of selling blue cats to, to be sold for eating and purposes and for dog food and other different things so there's been quite a market for that invasive species in the james at least and we've seen those permits were on the rise as far as people going out to try and catch those invasive species because they can sell them and they can uh, make some money off of it so that's been a big help there for us for sure um now we still see some pretty big issues and uh, it's funny one of my one of my family members uh, used to go down and catch those 80 pounds blue cats down on the james he said man you're getting rid of that you're getting rid of my blue cats like no you know we don't want those big ones we want the, the little ones but uh but eventually because you can't eat the big ones of course mm -hmm. by accumulation you're only supposed to eat the ones that are Ugh, yeah less than a certain age um which is you know they put those the department of health puts those warnings out every year each waterway gets different 
you know, uh, standards. Most of them are probably pretty similar, but yeah, you get those, uh, those consumption warnings on don't eat that are above this thing. And really what it comes down to is time. They, if they're above a certain size, they've been in the water for mm-hmm. us, you know, at least, you know, two to three years. And there's a certain point where that accumulation gets dangerous. So for, for human consumption. So, um, which is kind of creepy to think about, <laughs> but mm-hmm. Do you have flathead in the river? As we well? do. We do have flathead, but we don't have as big of a problem with them in the James. We we have them, but the channels and the and the blues are are well. Ch- channels basically have have hung in there, but we we still have a flathead problem. I, I think everybody that's got flatheads in their river has a problem, but not as not as not as much as we have in the lower with the blues. Why yeah. do you think that is? Like it hasn't been as much of an issue for you with the flatheads. Is it have to do with the river's ecosystem itself? Is it more resilient or something? Well, like you that? know, I think a lot of that comes down to. Um, you know, the, the impact that they have, of course, is they, the, the big knock that you hear on them is that they're eating all the smallmouth. They're eating all of the, the young stock of smallmouth. And I think you'll probably hear more of that on rivers that get fished more uh, because you're, you've got more people out there that are trying to catch those fish. Um, and so it's looking for something to blame, you know, looking for. And, and sometimes in a lot of cases, the flathead is the first one on the list to say it's this guy's fault. Um now, DWR still does catch a lot of them, so uh, that that's one that I'm not as well versed on, but uh, I, I do know that they are just like living vacuum cleaners. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, anything that's that's alive and swims in front of them, they'll suck it down. I just um, find it fascinating how in some ecosystems you have that, that homeostasis, everything can work together. You look at the Mississippi watershed or the New River where uh, flathead are native, there's no issue. But when they get introduced to like the James, the upper Potomac, where we're having an issue with flathead, it's like all of a sudden, it, or the Susquehanna, mm-hmm. all them, there's a huge fight. If you have like catfish tribe versus smallmouth tribe on the Sus- Susquehanna, people are hate flathead. Yeah. But it's always my question, like, that is interesting why this is an issue here when you go, you know, 200 miles over, 100 miles over, and then it works out there. Why is it that this has found some kind of like peace? And I'm wondering too, is it, are the reproductive numbers greater too? Because I know smallmouth are low reproductive numbers, but <laughs> mm-hmm. as far as it, eggs, yeah. but because I, I know too, like when you see them like in schools, they're just huge, they're massive, mm-hmm. like it's almost black water. And it's like, you don't see that like with musky. I mean, I was thinking two things big, bigger you are, the more you got to eat. Mm-hmm. Like you say, they're going to eat, they got, there's only so many groceries. But not just how big they are, but how many there are. And mm-hmm. so I wonder too, like, so where's musky, like you're saying, even though a musky are also a big fish, big eating fish, but are consuming a lot, there doesn't seem to be as many quantity. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if that's because, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I don't want really to see them. They're just, they're just massive yeah. schools of them. And yeah. I don't know if that is a factor too, that that is different. Because I kept thinking too, like you were saying, the catch and release was very big. So we're going to catch that smallmouth, we're putting it back. Now that, that's an, that's a good take though, as far as trying to promote taking them out, getting them right. out of the water, especially if there's an excessive population of mm-hmm. them. Sure. But sure. I also don't know if Mother Nature always seems that they talk about bird populations, it'll spike in population, then it'll it'll actually fall off and regress because there's not enough food, but they're all competing for the same food source. I don't know what the yeah. answer is. I just yeah. know no, it's, it's just interesting to hear the debate uh, about that, the topic yeah. and yeah. And with the lack of a presence of a species, a dominant species yeah, like true. the small mouth, you mean, know, yeah, a small yeah. mouth, you're going to have, you know, a niche that, yeah. that, that, that fish can kind of fill true. in. True. Yeah. And those bigger fish, nothing's eating those. There's yeah. nothing eating that. Mm-hmm. Interesting story on the, on the flatheads. So there's a spot just east of Lynchburg where we, we pick up some people from trips sometimes. And there is a, um, why am I blanking on it right now? It's a tree that has berries on it. Oh, gosh. Um, mulberry it's a mulberry tree right on the banks of the river and every year when the mulberries start falling off the tree you look down below that tree and there are 50 catfish Mm -hmm. waiting under that tree for the mulberries to fall Mm -hmm. now those fish just happening to see them falling and all congregating or are those the same fish coming back because they know that mulberry tree is dropping mulberries off That's an, that's an interesting question for me. I'd like to tag and those. If but, a, and if they're reproducing, how many females and how many, and I don't know how many eggs they lay, but I'm just, I'm just thinking of it that mm, way too. Right. I mean, it's and that, where it can easily get out of balance. Like you were talking about. It's just, it's fascinating to me, like why it works in some ecosystems and it doesn't mm-hmm. when it's, and again, like this is why people get paid the big bucks and have better education sure. to me. Yep. Um, I would like love this. to have Odin Kirk on and the guy that he co-wrote the paper with at, at Auburn. If I could win the lottery and fly him out here and he could talk mm-hmm. about that, that would be a dream for mine. Cause it is so fascinating. Cause then it's like, if you know why this ecosystem worked here and it could, we maybe 
simulate that to kind of get it back because kelby brought it up unless you like poison the waterway there's no way you're getting rid of the blue cats like mm -hmm. there's there's physic they're here like yeah. i don't think you could physically do that so we got to learn some way to kind of make it work um i mean maybe you could get them out but i, I don't think that's logically possible you know what i mean <laughs> So, that, but we're, but we're not going to be able to fix that today. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, what else do you guys have coming up? Is there any major? Uh, well, we just a lot of our efforts are ongoing. Just we're always mm -hmm. plugging right ahead to try and keep moving forward. But this time of year definitely brings forth a lot more opportunity. So we're doing a lot of spring plantings. Our buffer program is is in full effect. Do a lot of that in the fall too. But we're out there right now with volunteers putting trees in the ground, um, getting former converting former farmland into nice forested riparian areas. Uh, so we're into that big right now. Our education program has really kicked off. It's that time of year. We're back in the classroom. We're get ready to kids get the kids back out on the water um earth day is coming up of course so uh with earth day coming up we have a lot of cleanups that go on with during that time so we do a lot of river cleanups we partner with actually star hill brewery during that time to do a cleanup in the lynchburg area as well in the richmond area so come clean hmm. up with us for a little while and then come after and get a free beer and t-shirt so where do you get your trees um you know that is that is a question for my, our tree folks but i think the the state um we get a lot from the state mm -hmm. But I think there's some other private sources that we have gotten some from, I remember from I was too. teaching the ag. I taught an outdoor ed class. But the ag department, a lot of times, would get, like, your live olive pine and stuff. And that was and it was kind of cool because they would give you, like, mm -hmm. you could take them and, and we would plant them. And, that, and that's just a cool thing, too. I didn't mind. I'd love going out and, you know, planting them. Not all sure. of them would survive, but it's still – it's a good way to get that stuff in, in your hands. And, mm -hmm. you know, again, just another education. And you get you outside. Oh, it's yeah. It's helping Mother Nature. Then it that's, is. Uh, you know, those programs oh, that's are so really fascinating great. To me too. Yeah. We gotta have someone on. We get from so there. busy with stuff. I know I get busy with work and stuff. You yeah. forget everything that's going on. Sure, um, but little things you can do to help. I mean, oh, like yeah. it's like um, you know, last fall I had the opportunity. Uh, Matt Sell, who who's the DWR agent for Maryland, he runs the Deep Creek area, and I've never been to Deep mm -hmm. Creek. And I go there, and you know, I always had in my mind that this place is super packed, tons of houses. And you get out on the lake, and it's beautiful foliage. Mm -hmm. and it's like there's no houses here. It's like mm -hmm. well. What they did there at the state is like you have to have a I think it's like 300 feet, but it's a massive buffer. You got to keep mm -hmm. all your trees because of the foliage. It's a big cell there. Mm -hmm. So you get there and you don't realize that it has probably just as many, if not more houses than like Anna. Mm -hmm. But how they structured it, you can barely see them mm -hmm. because they kept so many trees. And you wonder, it's like this is something like why aren't mm -hmm. they doing this everywhere mm -hmm. in these lakes to keep the natural habitat, to keep that buffer zone? It mm -hmm. makes so much sense. That, and then you're like the yeah. state doesn't require it. It's just like yeah. that goes back to your what are we doing wrong here? Put your dollar and your record. Yeah. and your wake borders and things like that then you got moo mall who does, doesn't have a the nothing been a long nothing time at all nothing. there's nothing yep so yep. lake erosion camp, yeah that'd be and, and a lot of it's too they were a victim of kind of knowing this stuff after this stuff has been developed right. you know a lot of, a lot of the cases like with your older ones smith mountains and lake annas they they were they were packing those houses in before we really right. had any idea of buffer zones and stuff like right. that so that, that's that is cool i mean you've yeah. talked about trying to create new water like lakes and stuff and that if you could create and he talked about texas and mm -hmm. that stuff, but it's, it is it's when you start thinking about that way let's build a, a fishery that doesn't have it's not about the dollar not about even recreational let's make it a fishery and let's make it you know which moon is kind of like that. oh yeah, yeah. Right. I, I, more likes we built like I, I don't like this idea that, like there'll never be another lake built it's like there's too much money in it i mean w when when a homeowners association can tell the the army corps of engineers like Kerr, we want the water to be like level now right that's how much power they have and so eventually there will be new lakes built and so my thought is when that happens let's be smarter about it let's take right. some of the lessons we learned about yep. the erosion the buffer exactly. zone let's do things better man can you, so imagine, it's amen. Can you imagine if you had 100 percent control of a fishery and then just and it was even like that a stream into mm -hmm. a, a lake or whatever i mean and just and it is a it is a ecosystem a closed system closed, closed system yep system that you have 100 percent control can you imagine yeah yeah, I mean, and that, saying that too, ones that are in the state because of the efforts you all do. Oh yeah, hundred percent. It's a great, it's a yeah. great state, and even the tri-state, Pennsylvania, Maryland. I mean, they're all we West Virginia. I mean, all these places really, the natural resources are there, and, it, yeah. and we're we're blessed to have that. So I don't want yeah. to make it sound like yeah. it's all negative either or bad. Yeah. Just, well, you bring up an interesting point, you know. And I, my when I first came into the job, and I'm still very much like this. My my whole goal was to get the public on the water, get out there, and every inch do right. everything have fun fish hunt all that stuff get right. out there and do it uh, and then as and i still want that but as i as we go through the years and i realize is that necessarily the best thing mm -hmm. for the river or for the for the ecosystem right. and then not all in not all cases it is right 
And so it's this weird dichotomy of, you know, you want the public out there, but yet you're what's going to ruin it if you get too much out there. Exactly. So it's hmm. it, that keeping some things private yes. is not yeah. necessarily a bad, that's my, that's no, also that's kind good. of my stick on the Jackson thing. It's a little bit of a double-edged sword. Yeah. Yeah. It's that, yeah, I do not like the way that that is, but is it maybe keeping that fishery a little more intact than it would have been if it's if it was just exclusively all the way open? Correct. And there's more of that as you can kind of move above like like move off. So just interesting things to yeah. think about, you know, that we're so sometimes we're our worst enemies and maybe we need to leave that one alone. Right. You know, that where we come back to and fish for a certain season of the year Correct. and then we let it sit for the rest of the year. And Not I still always think, open all the time. Yeah, it's yeah, fascinating. You talked about map early on and I got to thinking, I don't know what your age is, but I, I thought, yeah, it was literally a map. It wasn't the phone. Yeah, on Google Earth. It was a map, mm -hmm. a paper map. So, yep. Um, but even now, I challenge. I think even with the resources we have now, it's not near as bad as what people either think or and it could it could be or should be. Because I don't think mo most people don't get out and go do it. Most of us, there's only there's very few that are actually adventurous enough to go out and explore and and go to try to find new places. Right. Um, but. But yeah, that's it's fascinating. In other it? words, I'm saying too, you could say, hey, there's this is here, but how many people are going to really, they're going to hear it and say, yeah, I want to do that. Mm -hmm. But how many people actually get in the vehicle yeah. and go do it? Yeah. You know, I've been wanting to fish Moom all for a while. It's been a long time since I've been down there. We used to trout fish in Jackson. It, it, this is a bucket list item now. I want to get down yeah. there. I want I want to highlight some of these areas because no one knows about this. Like I really feel like, especially with the, the outpouring I had when I started to cover the Upper James, and then I looked into it, and no one knows about this stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's so sad because unless a major bass tournament goes there, mm -hmm. it doesn't get the traction. Mm -hmm. and, and again, I had a guy on last night who, who won the BFL. Uh, at Kerr, and he said, "Like, what's crazy about Virginia is like you have to travel so far. The Shenandoah Division, the BFL, mm -hmm. it's too much traveling." Yeah, and I'm like, "But if you live here, you're used to it. If I, if I, if I gave away a guided fishing trip tomorrow for anywhere in Virginia, people will go because they're used to commuting. Mm -hmm. We're a commuter society here. Whether you live in Richmond or you're up near DC, because of 95, you're used to driving. Mm -hmm. So if I, if I ask you, like, you want to go to Lynchburg for a weekend to go musky fishing, people will go because they're used to driving, mm -hmm. which is so neat. So I don't think the distances here hurt bother people as much." I could be wrong, but that's just kind of my hypothesis. Mm. So I think we can bring awareness to a lot of these issues and these these opportunities to stay local in Virginia, um, and and you know use commerce there. But the way you're tackling too with education with your schools is, is great too because you're not just you're not just opening up a saying go here. You're I think you're educating on when you when you go here. Make mm -hmm. sure you take your trash out. Don't sure. litter. Don't you know respect this. Yep. fish care you know all those things i mean and, that's, and that's something i'm proud of along with that like just knowing what to do i mean just at a much simpler <coughs> level you know that at a certain point and actually we're just a few years away from this there, there won't be a kid in the city of lynchburg that will graduate college or graduate high school and say i've never been in a kayak before that's awesome. every mm -hmm. one of those kids that will have been that in is a kayak awesome before twice probably that's awesome. so that's i mean that's yeah, that's a skill that you're giving them for a lifetime, Absolutely. you know, and that's, they can take it where they want to take it. And that's one of those things if they develop that love. But of course, once you, once you get them there, they're hooked and they want to just like you all, yes. you want to know every little piece of it. Yes. And then, then you got them. And that's so. what I experienced without teaching outdoor education. I only had two classes. I do two in the fall, two in the spring, but you know, and, it, and I took for granted, I thought everybody's been in a canoe, you know, we live here and where we live and you got front roll right there. Like, yeah, everybody's grown up to do it, but they didn't. That's right. And so when you take them out there, whether it was a hike on old rag mountain or, you know, fishing, canoeing the river, camp along the river and how many kids later on would come back, you know, Mr. Mount, Coach Mouse, where, where, where do we go? What was that place? You know? And again, I just, I'm always amazed because now again, with the resources they have, like it's not hard to look it up and find it, but I don't mind telling them, but it's, That's right. uh, they do it for a lot of them that sticks and yep. and uh yeah and gets them out so that's, that's important cool. rob like again i like i know you got a long drive ahead of you i don't want to keep <laughs> you here all night um is there anything else that we we want to hit real quick that we forgot to cover or anything that you would like to uh for us to advertise or promote where people can find you yeah or... yeah yeah well, uh, my office is based out of lynchburg uh, we have an uh, our our arm of putting people out on the water is called James River Adventures. If you want, if people want to look that up, all of our offerings out of the city of Lynchburg are listed there. Our organization just really tries to be the eyes, ears, and voice of the James River. So again, like you were saying, if you're out there and you see something, you want somebody to report it to, we'll be happy to be the the voice that you reach out to to get that message, to, and we'll dive right on whatever issue it is. But um, you know, just just support. Uh, just just the little things like you were talking about earlier, you know, just doing the little things that you can possibly do. It all adds up. It adds up. And to be honest, what it comes down to is people ask me all the time, what did your organization do 
to fit because our the, the James is progressively getting better. It is with the yes. cleanest waterway to enter the James the uh, the Chesapeake Bay, which we're very proud of that. Really, uh, the, uh, the major rivers. We're, the, we're yeah. the cleanest major river entering into the Chesapeake Bay, getting a little bit better every year. But people ask us all the time, like, "What did you do to help fix the James River?" It's like we didn't do anything. It's what we stopped doing, and the river will bring itself back. And that's what we can all mm-hmm. take that for any waterway across the country. If you can stop putting that stuff and and clogging its arteries with all that junk and let, let time go it will come back but you have to stop putting stuff into it so and that's and that's the big takeaway and if anybody if everybody went with that we'd be we'd have massive fish everywhere <laughs> we don't have to worry about it going different places to find them but um no other than that yeah just keep keep up what you're doing get outside go fishing find those new spots fill in those dark spots on the map uh, you will not regret it even if you don't catch the big fish you were looking for I guarantee you, you, you'll find um, some solace while you're out there for sure. Guys, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today. Please go support your local river keeper. If you're out on the water, see something, just go say something to them, bring attention. I'll also link the first thing down below will be the phone number. Um, I'll get that from Rob, the best phone number to, to contact if you're floating and you see something on the river that you think uh, should be brought to their attention. Again, like and subscribe to the channel. We are the number one fishing show in the greater DMV metropolitan area. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.